Welcome. Good evening. We do want to have dialogue. That's what drives this diverse democracy. So I encourage you, please, uh, fill out the cards, uh, send the questions up, and I'll weave them in. This is an opportunity uh, to have a candid conversation. It's just a wonderful all-star cast uh, that we have gathered. Uh, I will reiterate and emphasize something uh, that Buck said. Uh, this is a nonpartisan event. We're not here to campaign for uh, any particular candidate or cause, uh, and we do want to bear that in mind. So I will uh, do my uh, level best uh, to remain neutral at all times. And just uh, to allow us to hear from each of our half dozen, I'll uh, introduce them uh, one by one, and they'll start uh, by answering a, a question uh, that I will uh, pose to each of them. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about who they are, uh, and then uh, we'll jump right in, and I'll uh, try to frame uh, this conversation so it's productive and gives you something uh, to think about. So we have, uh, starting in the order uh, that you have on the program, and their full bios are here, so I'll just be very brief, Assemblymember David Chu, who represents the 17th District. Uh, he does need to leave a bit early, so that is not a result of anything that's said. He'll be excusing himself and, and ducking out uh, for another event. We have Carmen Chu, the assessor and recorder, uh, elected uh, by the voters of the city and county of San Francisco. Harmeet Dillon, who uh, is a uh, prominent trial lawyer and specialist in election law, and also a member of the Republican National Committee uh, and chair of the uh, Republican Party of California. R.T. Coley, uh, who is in her second stint as the interim executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, formerly known as the Asian Law Caucus uh, here in San Francisco. Assemblymember Evan Lowe of the 28th District, Assemblymember Phil Ting of the 19th District. So uh, it's a wonderful group. You have uh, full bios in the program, uh, a list of uh, sponsors uh, who also are joining with the Asia Society. So uh, it's just uh, great to, to see this turnout. You know, I'll frame this uh, by uh, saying that when I was a kid growing up uh, in uh, the Midwest in the 1970s, my mother never told me I could be president. Uh, she did think that I could be an engineer or scientist. Uh, she was a little surprised when I said I wanted to be a lawyer. And I think that's a common experience for many Asian immigrants, the descendants of those who were strangers from a different shore, in Ronald Takaki's words. We were always portrayed as uh, apathetic, as more concerned about quote unquote homeland politics uh, than domestic civil rights. And so uh, when we started to stand up and speak out, which began here in San Francisco far earlier than anyone ever uh, realizes with uh, cases being brought by some of the earliest Chinese uh, starting in the 1870s all the way up to the United States Supreme Court with civic groups being formed uh, by uh, Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, uh, and uh, with so many others uh, as they came uh, agitating and even running for office, uh, South Asian from California Central Valley uh, being uh, uh, tapped by the voters uh, to go to Congress in the 1950s. This history of Asian American civic engagement and political participation has been rich and varied. But in the past decade, we now realize that Asian Americans are the fastest growing demographic group. We have an opportunity now to make a difference. Here in the Bay Area, where there's always been a substantial Asian American population, it's not unusual to see people uh, who look different than what some would perceive of as a real American. People who are still asked, uh, where are you really from, or told to go back to where you came from, running for office and winning. Uh, it's uh, no longer astonishing to believe that someone Asian American could aspire to the highest offices in the land. And so uh, with that uh, as a framing, uh, and again, uh, please do uh, take a question card and uh, fill it out with your uh, thoughts. Uh, what would you like to hear from this panel? Uh, I'll ask uh, an old friend, uh, David Chu, uh, the first question and uh, the panelists, if uh, we could start with uh, just brief answers, uh, two or three minutes at most. David, uh, did your mother ever tell you you could be president? Absolutely not. Uh, I think I grew up with probably a similar experience as, as my guess is almost all of us up here. 
uh, I was raised to do what every good Asian immigrant kid is supposed to be when he grows up. I was supposed to become a doctor. And uh, took all my pre-med courses uh, and then decided in the middle of college uh, that, uh, that I felt called to, to community service and activism, was uh, fascinated by the civil rights movement, decided to go to law school. Um, but um, politics was, I think, the farthest thing from, uh, from my own experience when I, was, when I was growing up. And in fact, uh, those of us who come from immigrant backgrounds, from Asian countries, uh, we're often told that uh, folks who go into politics uh, are either corrupt or killed by corrupt people. And neither of those were experiences that uh, my mother or parents wanted to see happen to me. Uh, so it, it really was, was nothing that, uh, that we ever talked about in the dinner table growing up. Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, turning uh, to Carmen. Uh, Carmen, uh, what are the obstacles uh, that Asian Americans face as they try to become active in politics, uh, aside from their own parents? You know, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, my my parents similar. They're when they were immigrants to the United States as well. And so, uh, when I was growing up, their biggest uh, goal for me was to get an education. It was something that they didn't have a chance to do. And so, I think from there, the skies were the limits. But I think, as many of us know, who are in politics and who have run for political office, it's not an easy thing. And so, when we think about um, what it takes in order to be successful at running, whether it is being able to fundraise or it's being able to have uh, political support, community support, um, we need to take a look at the infrastructure that exists out there to support candidates who look like us, who represent our values. We see, even among a lot of the leaders that we have who help to make that happen, not a whole lot of women, for example, who are in leadership positions to help with perhaps fundraising or are in charge of wonderful large organizations that can help mobilize people. Uh, we see not a lot of people who are people of color who are in those institutions as well. Um, I think in San Francisco we have a very unique scenario where we have a lot more diversity than in other places. I think we are blessed for that. Um, but I think when we think about some of the obstacles that do exist, we also need to think about all the institutions that it takes to support um, and people who are interested to serve in public office to be successful. Uh, turning now uh, to Harmeet, how has this changed over time? Uh, you're interested in mentoring and grooming the next generation of leaders. The folks on this panel, I won't speculate as to their age, uh, but they're older than the folks who are just coming out of college, just uh, thinking about this. Do Asian immigrant parents now say to their children, you could be president? Well, thanks, Frank. And um, I want to mention just one correction to my resume. I, Frank gave me a promotion. I'm the former vice chairman of the Republican Party in California, not the chairman. The current chairman would probably be pretty you know, put out to hear that. Um, but I am the national committee woman. Just like the other panelists who have spoken so far, uh, I came up in a family where it was not desirable to be a politician. In India, politicians are generally viewed as corrupt. Um, you know, I like my uh, my colleague at the end there. I went to uh, an Ivy League school and I was pre med. And it was only when I got swept up in a political issue uh, with a college campus newspaper, the Dartmouth Review, which I was the editor of, that I began to have an interest in politics. I joined the American Civil Liberties Union and you know went to law school instead of medicine. My parents were okay with that. They were happy that I got a good education. Um, but getting into politics, I was actually the first Indian American to be a major party nominee um, in California for a assembly or a Senate seat, and then I became the first Indian American to become a major party nominee for Senate in California, which, you know, having Indian Americans here in the state for over 100 years is very striking. You mentioned the Leap Singh Sand, who was a member of Congress from the 1950s from the Central Valley. He's a Sikh uh, American, and that was a long time ago. So. It has, uh, in my generation, certainly not been a path that uh, has been encouraged by parents, but I'm now of the age um, that a lot of young people and their parents even who think their kids are suited for politics will reach out to me and I call them, you know, the uncles and the aunties will email me and say, please talk to my daughter, please talk to my son, how can I help them get a start in politics? And um, I try to be an evangelist about this, and the fact of the matter is that most Indian Americans do not share my political party. Uh, over 80% of Indian Americans vote for the Democratic Party, but my message to all of these people is that, number one, it's important to vote and be engaged, 
And number two, that the barriers to entry uh, to politics are actually much lower than they are to medical school, for example, uh, or to <laughs> law school even. You don't have to take on a lot of debt or invest a lot of years. And, um, and uh, all it takes is walking down to the local uh, county um, Democratic, Republican, Green Party office and volunteering. That's how I got my start in politics. Um, registering voters outside the Masonic uh, Center um, was my first job in politics in San Francisco. And uh, you know now I'm the RNC National Committee woman 12 years later, pretty rapid uh, ascent. I agree with Carmen that the, I, I would say as a candidate who's run twice myself here in San Francisco and anywhere, fundraising is the biggest cultural obstacle. Um, Begging for money is certainly very foreign to my Punjabi culture. It's, you know, we don't even take welfare. That's considered to be very disgraceful. So it's, you know, definitely a foreign concept. And I think that's one of the areas where telling people about that and, and letting them know that you have to start thinking about it early, making those connections. Uh, you don't just start and throw your hat in the ring and run for Congress, which is what a lot of my uh, young peers want to do. I think that's a mistake. So that's kind of bad news for them. But the good news is that people are asking those questions. And I am seeing a lot more Indian Americans run for office. That's great. Uh, turning uh, to Arti, who is an experienced advocate and uh, bridge builder, uh, let me ask a, a more provocative question. Uh, what about the hostility that Asian Americans sometimes still face? The New York Times had a front page article last week uh, written by someone, a journalist at the Times, who was uh, asked and told uh, what many of us have heard to go back uh, to China, go back mm -hmm. to where you came from. <laughs> this is someone who's a US citizen, uh, whose son then said, why did that stranger uh, shout that at them because they uh, aren't from China? Not in that sense. So what do we do uh, when there is angry rhetoric? People uh, who doubt uh, that we belong at all, that we should be deported uh, because of faith or color of skin, uh, or even sometimes they're complimentary and they say after we give a speech, my, you speak English so well. Right. <laughs> um, I'm an immigrant and I've gotten that comment uh, quite often. Um, I mean, this is the, the challenge for Asian Americans. We are the per perpetual foreigners. Um, and although you might have a descendant who, you know, lived here in the early 1900s, you're going to be constantly viewed as... A, as if you are an immigrant. Um, and it has actually, I mean, I think the rhetoric is obviously it's, there's racism and it's front and center, but it actually has real world consequences. I mean, what we're seeing now, I work at um, Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, and we do a lot of work with vulnerable communities. And we have been hearing about bullying just really ramping up, particularly of six, you know, uh, kids who are wearing the turbans and, um, and uh, Muslim kids. And so we actually just recently, um, the governor signed our bill, which where schools have to provide resources to kids who are being bullied because of their perceived religion or national origin. Um, but that's, you know, we actually have to think about solutions that are concrete. I think um, obviously sh shifting the narrative is important. It's great that the journalist could, you know, put that story in, uh, in the front page of the New York Times, but that's not enough. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done um, on behalf of very, you know, communities at this moment who are very fearful. We're trying to register voters in a range of Asian communities and South Asian, Middle Eastern, Muslim communities, and you have people who are afraid to register to vote. That, to me, is voter suppression. And that's voter suppression based on narrative. It's not actually even someone standing over them. Though that might, you know, according to, I guess, um, some candidates are proposing that people do go stand over people when they're voting. So um, we do have to still fight for our civil rights. And I think that that's why I, I feel really honored to do the work that I do, work for the organization that I do, because although we're 44 years old, um, the fight just continues. Thank you. Uh, moving uh, to Evan, who uh, made history as uh, the nation's uh, youngest 
out LGBT mayor. Uh, let me ask a question about multiple identities. Uh, how uh, difficult is it uh, and how possible is it, is it uh, for uh, Asian Americans who are LGBT uh, to uh, succeed in politics and to uh, balance those multiple identities and uh, different uh, uh, roles that they might have? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I think it's uh, the uh, dual identity is important to share about the American experience and that there are similarities between that of the struggles uh, that you teach about in your classroom uh, and in your textbooks, Frank. And uh, we need to continue to talk about the coalitions that we build together. And so the civil rights movement for the LGBT community, we are simply asking for the similar rights of all Americans that all Americans are afforded. And similarly, as we, uh, I used your book in an Asian American studies class that I was helping to uh, teach at De Anza College, we talked about the struggles of Chinese Americans here and the similar struggles and the commonalities uh, that we have between that. Uh, but I will also say that when you talk about the strengths of coalitions, uh, it is important to talk about how, as a heterosexual, why it's important to stand up for LGBT rights. And that's why in the state legislature, uh, Assemblymember Chu and Assemblymember Ting are such champions of the LGBT community, not only because it's the right thing to do, but it's because they believe in it. And they also understand the struggles that Chinese have also faced here in the United States and America. That's why, for example, also the... Uh, DNC, at the DNC level, at the Democratic National Committee, there is a the ch vice chair of a major party of our Democratic Party is Asia Pacific Islander, and that's Congresswoman Grace Meng. And before that, and before that, two positions ago, it's always been Asia Pacific Islander. And so, for the infrastructure of the recognition of political power. The Democratic Party has recognized the importance, not just for empty tokenism, but the true meaningful value that Asian Pacific Islanders bring to the conversation. And oh, by the way, this transcends not just what we have here in the United States, but throughout the entire world. When we talk about the largest countries in terms of trade and economic development and the GDP with China and Japan being in the top tiers of the GDP, what is the conversation like when we have global powers having a conversation related to economic trade? And what does it mean then to have individuals who share the ethnic and cultural background of these communities? And how is that important and effective moving forward on international trade and policies. So when we talk again about the identities that we have, I think it gives a very important lens to the representation, again, not just in terms of empty tokenism, but what does it mean for in terms of the experiences and the values and for the new generations not to forget because the younger generations, as a millennial, I remember, because I, st I studied Asian American studies, so I remember the struggles that many of my families as a fourth generation Californian remember from the child from the experiences of my families. But for the future generations, what does it mean to be Asian Pacific Islander and how is it important and why is it important that we are vocal and that we're involved and that when there is a crisis that occurs, how do we respond to the next Wen Ho Lee case or the Vincent Chin or the Abercrombie and Fitch or now the New York Times and then the story on Fox News. How do we as a community respond to it? And then how do other community members that are non-Asian Pacific Islanders equally come in a coalition saying an injustice to all one community is an injustice to all communities? Our uh, last uh, opening question uh, to Phil Ting. I actually uh, live in his district, so I'm going to ask a question related uh, to uh, locality. A former uh, Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, once equipped, all politics are local. Phil, I wonder if you could share with the audience uh, how you got your start locally and how important it is uh, to start locally. By the way, I'm uh, using uh, first names for everyone uh, to put people at ease. I don't mean to disrespect uh, the distinguished office holders, all of whom should properly be addressed as the honorable so-and-so, uh, but uh, just to establish equality among all the panelists. Uh, so I hope you don't mind, uh, Phil, that, that I've uh, called you by your first name. Uh, but if you could talk about getting started locally uh, in, here in San Francisco. Well, as someone who has constituents, calling me by my first name is actually an improvement over some of the names we get called. So, so that's a good thing. Um, one of the way, actually, I had Carmen's job before I was the assembly member. I was the assessor recorder. And uh, prior to being appointed assessor, I was in the process of thinking about maybe running for 
a supervisor spot or a community college board position. And um, one of the positions that I had actually run for in 2001 was for a job that didn't exist. So that's kind of a funny way to get started in politics. There was a ballot measure to create a municipal utility district like East Bay Mud or in Sacramento we have SMUD in San Francisco. And if you wanted to serve on the board of directors, you needed to run for a non-existent board of directors at the same time the ballot measure was running. So you were actually running for a seat that didn't exist. So that was my entry point into um, San Francisco politics. But sort of, sort of like Harmeet mentioned, the way to get involved in politics is just to just get involved. It's, you know, a lot of people want to run for Congress or run for U.S. Senate or something right off the bat or governor of California. And, and most of the times there's a reason why you see people progress. It's because most of us have been volunteers. We've stood in front of registered voters. We've knocked on doors or we've phone banked. And um, really getting involved in politics, as Harmeet said, is it's, it's very low barrier to entry. It's just a way to get involved. And one of the fun things about running for an office that didn't exist is a somewhat more relaxed atmosphere. <laughs> but it was a way to literally meet every person in San Francisco who was involved in politics. I always joke in San Francisco, similar to every community, there's usually you know, a couple hundred people who are active in that community around political issues, whether regardless of by industry group or by interest group or by government. And it was a very quick introduction to get involved into uh, meeting all those folks. It was the fastest crash course in San Francisco politics. It was quite a bit of fun. Um, I uh, did well, but I ended up not winning the position, even though everyone thinks I did win the position. So it was a great, it was a great introductory experience and quite a lot of fun and sort of an interesting way to get introduced into San Francisco politics. So I take from the uh, opening uh, statements that uh, any of us can do this, that uh, we could aspire to this and someday uh, run against you or run for your office. That's wonderful. Uh, let me uh, start now uh, on the dialogue. Uh, these are, uh, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to run for office. Uh, these are great uh, questions. Uh, keep them coming. Let me start with one for any taker. Uh, that's, uh, again, a little more provocative, though strictly nonpartisan. How important are quote unquote homeland politics? How important should they be? Uh, the politics of Asia where our ancestors may have come from. I'll give you a concrete example. For, uh, for example, conflict between mainland China and Taiwan, a uh, conflict between India and Pakistan. Uh, how much are those issues on the minds of Asian American voters and should they matter? for any, any taker. Yes, please, go ahead. So if I were to run as the Indian American candidate in San Francisco or even in the Republican Party as Republican National Committee when I wouldn't get elected. And so throughout my career in politics, I've always tried to focus on representing the entire community. And my parents brought me here from India. I'm a first generation immigrant. And they brought me here to get away from some of the stuff that was happening in India in terms of the policies and the opportunities. And so my focus as a politician has always been to represent the people who I'm seeking to represent, which includes everybody, uh, Democrats, Republicans, people of all different backgrounds. Um, so I would say that the only times I talk about homeland politics in my um, races are if I'm doing personal advocacy. So I, in addition to being a politician, I also have a role as a civil rights lawyer and um, an activist on Sikh issues. I'm, I come from a Sikh family. My father wears a turban and my brother wears a turban. And so, you know, in that world, I'm fluent and I talk about those issues that matter to that specific community and use those in advocacy, call my friends in the assembly in Congress if there's an issue involving Sikhs in the military. But that's a different hat than the politician hat, which is to represent all the Republicans in California. Any other takers on the question of quote unquote homeland politics? Yes. I don't think it matters that much, uh, especially for those of us who are running in local offices. Local offices, as, as you had mentioned in your question, Frank, is very, very local quality of life issues, especially if you're running for city council or a board of supervisors. It's you know public safety, it's cleaning the streets, it's transportation, it's housing. Um, but I, I would point out that where homeland politics gets in the way is maybe when you're starting to run for US Senate or for Congress or some sort of national issue. And I'm reminded 
of the fact when Matt Fong, who at that point was our state treasurer, his mom, as you'll remember, was March Fong Yu, one of the longest serving and probably the most prominent Asian American elected officials when I was growing up. She was our Secretary of State when I was growing up, so you always see her name on the ballot book. And he was raised in the East Bay. He served in the military. So of course, the, um, the question he got, and I believe is at the Chronicle editorial board, was you know, if, there, if war broke out between China and the US, what side would you be on? That was a question. Right? I mean, and he had served in our military. He, he didn't serve in China's military, he served in our military. So I think it goes back to sort of this perpetual foreigner um, stigma that gets faced. But can you imagine someone who served in our military getting asked that question? And he was our sitting state treasurer. And this is, you know, regardless of party, right? It just, and his, and his mom had been a longtime public servant. So again, uh, it also, while, while Frank says anybody can run for office, those barriers are real, and, and these uh, homeland politics definitely can bleed in at different times. Okay, moving to our next question, I'm going to ask the same question uh, two different ways. So, uh, and this is uh, from the audience, uh, how can the fill in the blank of your party move forward in a productive way uh, to court the Asian Pacific American vote. So it's uh, directed uh, at any uh, respondent about your specific party and its plans to reach out to Asian Americans in particular. I no, mean, no, no takers? Oh. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not the politician in the group, <laughs> but I can say that um, in terms of, we have been trying to engage the Asian American community, um, and we've been doing voter registration, and we've been doing um, outreach, and I think there's a lot of steps that people need to take. One is that our um, a lot of uh, our folks in our communities speak very a lot of different languages, and we need to do outreach in, um, in language. We can't just always do it in English. Um, and actually, that's a part of what we're doing, um, getting ready for this election, is making sure that uh, elected officials are providing ballots in, um, in a range of Asia API languages. Um, and so outreach, just like if you look at what's happened with the Latino community, it's been years and years of engagement, and, and now you see it paying off. Um, we haven't invested that, because our, I think our communities were demographically too small. Nobody wanted to do the outreach. But now we're growing, and we're going to actually you know, make a difference. We're already making a difference in California. We'll be making differences, I think, maybe in Nevada and in other states this election. But you know, by the time we're a majority-minority country, Asians can tip the balance. We'll be 9%. So um, I would say it's in everyone's interest to do outreach to API communities, um, and it's Unfortunately, I think you have to do the hard work. You have to get out there and actually talk to people. You have to, and we are not a monolithic group. We've got a wide range of uh, subgroups, and you've got to engage them on the issues that they care about. And I think you, I mean, a Asians are not any different than other groups. They care about health care, they care about jobs, economic security, but there are a few discrete issues, for example, like immigration, that also matter. So you have to speak to people on the issues that they care about. And I'd like to add to that. I think one of the things that we need to do in our national politics more is to not take for granted the Asian American vote. I think it's very easy to say we support immigration reform. I'm going to work on immigration, and therefore you should support me. But if you take a look at what we were even taking a look at in terms of comprehensive immigration reform, it was a policy that was being put forward that would have changed how family reunification would have worked. And that's a big issue for many of our families. If we think about the Asian American uh, population here, a majority of the population had been born in another country and immigrated to the United States. And so the these issues of immigration reform, I think it's important to not gloss over it in our national politics, but to say, what are the specific issues that really matter to our communities? 
Um, and if we talk about immigration reform, don't talk to me about it at a high level. Don't take my vote for granted. Don't say you're going to work on immigration reform without really understanding what your proposals really will mean to my community. Is it going to break apart and not allow my community and my families to come back together? Uh, so I think it really is a matter of taking, not taking it for granted and to really look at what are the comprehensive, real, real solutions for immigration. The only thing I'd add, I mentioned to earlier, Frank, was that the, at the DNC, we have taken a very strategic approach institutionally by making sure that we had our vice chair of the DNC at the national level be of Asian Pacific Islander descent. It's no different at the state party level, which is that we have dedicated staff members focused on Asian Pacific Islanders and getting out the vote and articulating why we believe the Democratic Party is the party for Asian Pacific Islanders. We can do a lot better. Uh, but I would also say that the state party also makes a very focused approach at highlighting our talents within the state of California, which is to say that within the state legislature of our Democratic caucus, the chair of our assembly budget committee uh, is Phil Ting. Uh, the chair of the housing committee in the state legislature is David Chu. So we are very much focused on highlighting the talents and letting our communities speak for themselves. But it's done in a very purposeful way by highlighting the skill sets that are important, but by pushing them in front of uh, demonstrating why is it important to have a subject matter expert, and by the way, that is looking at coming from uh, the Asian Pacific Islander communities. Next question, uh, this has already been alluded to. What are the top issues for Asian Americans? And what, if you had an opportunity to talk to the president-elect for Asian Americans, what, you, what would you encourage him or her to focus on? So Asian American issues, what, what are they? Just like Carmen said, I think most Asian Americans have the same concerns as uh, everybody else does. I mean, not Carmen, but uh, um, so one example, though, of some issues where the Republican Party used an appeal to Asian American voters on a specific issue was uh, SB4, um, education, um, you know, reform, uh, affirmative action um, plans, and things like that, and and that was an area where. Asian American parents, the first generation uh, parents, who were very concerned about equal opportunity for their kids getting into schools based on merit, were very engaged on that. And I found here in the Bay Area that we got thousands and thousands of new volunteers for the party, people engaged, people holding fundraisers for mainstream candidates, signing up because they thought this was a very important issue for their community. And so, you know, as a party, we we were already behind this issue, but we actually used that to engage these people after that election and um, moving on to this election. Now those Asian Americans who support our party are engaged on that issue. But um, you know, speaking as an Indian American, I think certainly immigration is one of the issues that, uh, or p the family uh, unification issue is definitely one where the comprehensive immigration reform didn't seem to really address the fact that that was going to be very much of a negative impact on families like mine. My dad came here as a doctor during the Vietnam war where there was a need for doctors. So it was sort of a merit-based system. I came with him because he was allowed to bring his family. But uh, and then relatives came. But today, they wouldn't be able to come under the current uh, regime. And so that's something that affects a lot of, a lot of people. Um, I've also found that a lot of Indian Americans and other Asian Americans, certainly who support our party or are open to it, are concerned about economic opportunity, are concerned about taxation as small business owners, are concerned about crime. Uh, those of us who live in particularly urban environments. So uh, I think that what we've done as a party to appeal to different demographics is, um, this harkens back to the last question as well, is to find candidates who are representative of those communities and really encourage them. Um, just like Evan talked about highlighting people, in Southern California our party has got uh, Ling Ling Chang, Janet Nguyen, Young Kim, Michelle Steele. These are all stars in our party, all women by the way, something I'm proud of. And uh, you know they are able to speak to the concerns of those communities that they represent better than somebody who doesn't come from those communities. I think I would add to that by saying that uh, on the Democratic side, we have certainly uh, 
spent an awful lot of time focused on on the same issues. So, uh, and I would frame a lot of it in terms of the value of opportunity. So when it comes to education, uh, how do we ensure that our next generation of kids have the same opportunities that we all did? When it comes to uh, the opportunity for small business entrepreneurs within our various ethnic communities, how do we give them the opportunities that we all did? Immigration policy, again, harkens back to the opportunities that we all had or our parents or our grandparents had in being able to come here and making sure that, again, our brothers and sisters, our cousins, uh, and the next generation have those opportunities. I think related to that, um, the idea of equality, of, of, of fairness, uh, and of civil rights, uh, and, and making sure that our communities are not discriminated against, uh, have the same opportunities to advance in our, not just our, our higher education institutions, but also our Fortune 500 companies. And I know this has been a, a topic of the bamboo ceiling. How do we ensure that, uh, that our rank and file uh, uh, brothers and sisters are being able to break into uh, the the C-suites, uh, break through the glass ceilings to have, again, the opportunities that folks who may not look like us or have our same immigration background uh, do as well. Uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, both the Republican and Democratic Party have made appeals to that, but uh, I'd note in... in 1992, uh, George Bush had a 24% advantage when it came to API communities uh, and API, the API vote. In 2012, President Obama had almost double that, a 47% advantage within our API communities. And I think it's a reflection of, of where our party is and how they've been focused uh, on these issues and how they frame these issues for our community. Speaking of which, the next question is about Asian Americans as a potential block vote. Are Asian Americans a block vote? Should they be a block vote? Uh, is it something that you're working toward? That is, Asian Americans united all voting for a particular candidate, party, cause, uh, and trying to organize in that manner to deliver a block. Well, we're C3, so we're not working on that, but um, we are a Asian American organization that is pan-Asian. So um, we do see that there is, there are some similarities. Um, and I was actually just gonna, in reference to the last question, I would suggest to folks that if you're really interested in um, how Asian Amer Americans view these issues, um, that you look up the National Asian American Survey, which just came out, Karthik Ramakrishnan and Janelle Wong and a couple of other academics um, have worked on it, and it really lays out, you know, what are the issues um, and how do Asian Americans, um, even by subgroup, uh, feel about um, certain issues, how do they vote, et cetera. Um, and so that's the thing. So I think uh, Harmeet mentioned this. South Asians, Indians are like 70% um, in favor uh, or uh, are supportive of Democrats, whereas Vietnamese Amer uh, Americans are much lower. So you, I, I think it's really hard to say you have a block because you have actually the range. You've got um, Indians, Chinese, Japanese, and a whole bunch of smaller groups as well who sometimes we don't even have the numbers of, uh, you know, if you're a Cambodian or Laotian, like we don't even have the data, which is one of the things, I mean, I think last, Right, data disaggregation, we need the, that uh, bill. But that said, I think there are certain things culturally and um, where you can get people to align. Um, and like racism is one of them. And, and actually the alignment is just not only with Asian Americans, it's with other people of color. Um, and I think that that's what's gonna be interesting to watch as we demographically shift. Where are we gonna be aligned and how are we gonna be aligned? The next question, uh, we actually have several questions on the same theme, so I'm going to combine them, uh, is about this very subject of alignment. What about Asian Americans who are independent voters? How do they find their place, their voice in an increasingly partisan society? Uh, what sort of outreach is being done? And if you're Asian American but not interested in being affiliated with one of the two major political parties, uh, what role is there for you? 
Um, can I speak to that? Please. Actually, if you're in that category, you're in the fastest growing uh, demographic in California, and you are the most sought after uh, vote um, currency in, it, you're the, you're, you can play hard to get, and, peop, and politicians from both parties will be catering to you on actual issues as opposed to pandering to your race. And you know, I think that's one of the, the differences between the parties, frankly. Um, you know, I admire that all of the elected officials up here are, are Democrats, and, and they um, have, uh, you know, won their vote in, in a, in a uh, city that's not majority uh, minority as yet. But, you know, so it's, it, there is merit um, as a consideration. But too much, I think, here in California, at least, I see a lot of pandering to people based on their race, um, which I find offensive. And, and, and I think that if you're an independent voter, like a lot of Indian Americans increasingly what I've heard in this election cycle, perhaps because of the specifics of this election cycle, is people are disgusted with a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the negativity, and um, you know, people are voting on issues. So that's going to require parties, both parties and both major parties, to really compete on those issues. And you know, Sikhs are a complex example. On the one hand, we do face a lot of discrimination. Um, on the other hand, when I raised money to run for my assembly race and I was uh, giving fund having fundraisers in the Central Valley, you know, abortion and the right to life is a major issue in that community. And so even though they don't tend to vote more democratic, they're concerned about that issue. So there are a number of different issues if you really break it down where you can actually appeal to that independent voter by simply being the best candidate for their whole package of issues and not assume that they are going to lemming-like follow their other brothers on some specific issue because of their race. So related to that, uh, there are enough Asian Americans active now <coughs> that their endorsement is sought. What if they're split? <coughs> Excuse me. So in uh, the X versus Y race, uh, there are Asian American groups that have <coughs> endorsed both X and Y. Is this surprising? Uh, what does it mean? Well, that's a cop out, I'll say that. But anyway. Uh, is a is a question uh, that there are there, different Asian groups supporting right, different Asian yeah. candidates. Uh, so this particular race, and I, I'm not going to mention the race. Um, it's not two Asian American candidates. It's an Asian American candidate and another candidate not Asian American. But the, as the questioner notes, Asian American groups have split their endorsement. So there are some with X and some with Y. Uh, should we care about this? Does it surprise you? Is it important? Uh, what, what does it mean that Asian Americans now uh, are endorsing different candidates and come out on different sides? I think it fundamentally means we've, I mean, one perspective is we've arrived, right? We have uh, a large enough a community of folks who are engaged, who have differences of opinions, uh, that they end up supporting different candidates based on the appeal. And Harmeet, I think, referenced that. Um, you know, one of the interesting things I think about our community is we are incredibly diverse. We are not monolithic. You cannot stereotype uh, where we come from. And in fact, uh, in the legislature right now, uh, Phil, Evan, and I, we serve with the highest number of APIs that uh, we've ever had in the legislature. And we are bipartisan. We have Republican colleagues and Democratic colleagues, and it's very likely this coming November, our numbers will increase even more, and we will easily be the most bipartisan caucus. And what does that mean? Uh, it means, again, we're diverse, but I think there's an opportunity if we can figure out how to work across the policy differences, the ideological differences, that we can be the center point for, for where uh, where, where politics moves in our state. Uh, with some of the very old and longstanding discussions we've been having, you name the topic. Uh, we could be a place where we, we have the discussions and if we can hammer out differences uh, across, say, our partisan lines, uh, the API community uh, within at least the state legislature could be where the pivot point happens. And, and I think that's an exciting opportunity. And I'll, I'll add to that. When I was 
Uh, first, um, on a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, I think at that time I was the only Asian American serving uh, on the board at the time. And I'll tell you, there's a big pressure to say, well, then you represent all Asian Americans. Your vote, your voice represents all Asian Americans. But I think as David is saying, there's a diversity of opinions, there's a diversity of background and positions that our, our Asian American community has, frankly, on a whole host of different issues. And I think being able to have additional representation on the board, uh, certainly being joined joined uh, by David and by Eric later on, and then so on, um, has meant that you see a bigger spectrum, a wider spectrum of representation, and that's a, that's a positive thing. The thing that I always, when I go and I speak to um, high school students or anybody who's interested in politics, I always say that my one advice to anybody is regardless of the party affiliation, regardless of the endorsement that people have received, that people do their own research and really try to understand positions of candidates who are running for office really try to understand where are they on the things that matter to you most because you might actually be surprised. And so I think with anything, what I want most from our electorate is an electorate that is is educated about the choices that they are making. Don't follow necessarily what you think the label is, but do your own research on it. So there's a famous uh, quip that uh, author Gertrude Stein uh, made about Oakland, the city across the bay. She said, there's no there there. So I'm going to ask that question about Asian Americans. Is the term even, even meaningful? Because uh, Asian Americans comprise uh, more than three dozen ethnicities. And the person who submitted this question notes that on this panel, some of you have used the word Asian, some have used the word Asian American, some have used Asian Pacific Islander, some have used Asian Pacific American, and some have used abbreviations such as API, APA. So what does it mean to be Asian American? Is there a there there, or is there so much difference between the sixth generation Californian and someone in that pejorative phrase, fresh off the boat, between someone who's South Asian someone who's East Asian, uh, people of different faiths, is there a there there when we say Asian American? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think, look at us. Look at all of us in the room. Uh, whether we call ourselves Asian or API or a API uh, or Asian, the rest of the world looks at us and says we're all the same. And in fact, um, it, what's funny, look at Phil Ting and Evan and myself. We get confused all the time in our state legislature. <laughs> you're you're, you're uh, also good looking. <laughs> by, Thank by you, People Frank. who are paid to know who we are. Right. By, this is not like the public. This is by people who are paid. Like on, on TV, they'll get the names wrong. Luckily, I'm not confused for David. <laughs> Although because I'm, I'm a Chew and she's a Chew, people assume we might be related. <laughs> And we have two assembly member choose, two choose and a child. married in the beginning. That is true. <laughs> so, so the fact of the matter is the, the external world views us as similarly. And I would also say uh, I think there are far more similar experiences that we share with each other than we do with broader communities. And while the experience may not be identical, when I hear about a hate crime against another Sikh Californian, that makes me mad. And when Harmeet is out speaking for it, even though she was a vice chair of the California Republican Party, I say, you go, girl, because you're speaking for all of us who have experienced similar things. And so, uh, so I think it's important for us to focus on what, what, what brings us together. And, and again, culturally, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful that we have such cultural and rich diversity. But again, there are just so many things about uh, our cultural experiences and our social experiences and our family history that, that bind us together and, and thus cause us to have issues and interests and challenges and potential solutions that we can agree on more often than not. How about unpacking this a different way? Do we differ generationally? So the immigrant generation from the native born, from the fourth, fifth, or even sixth generation, uh, are there differences between different generations of Asian American voters? Yeah, absolutely, and I think um, I was gonna answer that last question this way, which is if you look at uh, generationally, where voters are is different than where we are at times as leaders, right? We try to 
try to bring about a, a pan-Asian way of thinking or a pan-Asian political discourse. But if you look at voters, they are very generationally driven. They're very linguistically driven based on language because they get their information primarily through the language they speak at home, which could be their native language or it could be English. Uh, and they also are very, at times, tribal and ethnic. We, we all know when you're in Asia, there is no like, we are Asian, right? You're Chinese, and even when you're in China, you're not even Chinese, you're Shanghainese, you're Cantonese, you're uh, from Beijing, you're, it's, there, there's, no, there's really no such thing. Um, and so when people vote, they vote in that similar way. So in, in San Francisco, there's no coincidence that most of the Asian American electeds in San Francisco are Chinese. It's not a coincidence that most of the Asian American voters, the residents, who are living in San Francisco, who are voters in San Francisco, also happen to be Chinese. Uh, we have one Korean American elected on the Board of Supervisors, uh, but she was elected with a huge amount of support from the Chinese community. How, we don't have a Filipino American, we don't have a South Asian on the Board of Supervisors, yet we have a f almost 40% of our population is Asian. So those ethnic distinctions still absolutely matter. Now we, we wanna try to be, be, you know, move beyond that, but oftentimes when, when folks vote, and you know, for those of us who care about politics, we study it, we, we are much more in the nuances of it, but a lot of times people just vote, they, they make a gut disti distinction, and a lot of it is people vote sort of what they're comfortable with and what they're familiar with. And oftentimes that is um, someone who's their ethnic group, or if there's no, no one of their ethnic group on there, maybe they vote for somebody who happens to be Asian American. And that, that is still, reality right now, and that's still very, very common, whether you're in the Asian community, the Latino community, African American community. Um, fortunately for us as Asian American candidates, uh, if you look at some of our other colleagues in the legislature who are Latino, African American, they come from primarily Latino or African American districts. Uh, there are actually almost no Asian American districts per se. So traditionally, Asian Americans get elected from all over the state in a variety of places. So for example, our, our colleague Rob Bonta from the East Bay, he, he is in a district that a Latino could represent, someone who's Asian could represent, African-American, someone who's Caucasian. It's a very, very, very diverse district. Any, any person who could really coalition build and bring those communities together is really gonna be the candidate who's gonna win. And I think that is one thing that we've done really well. We've been able to succeed without being in majority API, Asian or Chinese districts, we've really had to build those coalitions and not just appeal to our own particular community, but really appeal to voters across the board. So here's a very policy-oriented question and a special shout out. It's from a University of California Hastings law student. So uh, this follows this discussion. There is a movement now to disaggregate the data on Asian Americans, that is to break us out by ethnicity for government reporting purposes, so it isn't Asian American anymore, but is characterized Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Korean, Vietnamese, and so on. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, is this uh, positive, is it negative, do you support it? How will it change Asian Americans in politics? I'll, I'll start, and unfortunately I need to leave after this question, so I apologize for that. But uh, I think all of us who are legislate, legislators here, we've all supported the idea that uh, while there are many things that bind our communities, if you look at uh, the Chinese American community from the Filipino community, from our South Asian communities, um, we do have different experiences when it comes to healthcare. We have different experiences when it comes to poverty, when it comes to other social service areas, education, uh, housing, you name the area. And uh, f when you have governments making decisions about very scarce public resources, I happen to be one who thinks that it's important for us to know more facts to objectively understand who is experiencing what when it comes to Chinese, exper Chinese Americans experiencing higher rates of, of cancer uh, or Vietnamese Americans experiencing uh, other types of, uh, uh, of, of, of health indicators or other Asian Americans who experience mental health differently. It's important for us to know that so that we can think about the right kinds of public policies that that address that. And uh, I think unfortunately this discussion has been a bit conflated with 
other debates around other topics, uh, but fundamentally what I think many of us are seeking is, 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 is our facts uh, and numbers that help us make fact-based and evidence-based decisions. Okay, so uh, part of political power, some might say much of it, is money. Why isn't there an Asian American big funder on either side of the aisle? No, no, no takers on this question. <laughs> you're, 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 you're all, you're all looking for that funder. <laughs> Should we be? I'll reframe the question. Should we be encouraging Asian Americans to give more? to political parties and candidates and well, causes? You know, when I ran for the State Assembly in 2008, um, my community for, for 20 plus years, at least my family had been, like back in North Carolina, they, they had fundraisers for Jesse Helm, so they understood the importance of participating as donors in the political process. And then I found there to be a very positive outpouring of support from you know the, the community when I ran for office and, you know, Half of the donors knew that there was no chance that I was going to win uh, in uh, my district, and they gave me money anyway because they wanted to see people like me uh, continue involvement in politics. And then some of them thought I was going to win. I did not engage in any false advertising as a lawyer. Uh, you know, I was pretty clear with people about that. But um, now, eight years later, what I've seen is that it's actually a lot easier for people like Ro Khanna, like Ash Kalra. Uh, to uh, have fundraisers and expect people to show up and write checks. So it's, it is a color, kind of a cultural thing. And, and as to your question about the major donors, um, I think it's a generational thing as well. I think, in the, not, not to engage in too many cliches, but you know, when you come as a first generation, you're really concerned about uh, educating your children, buying your house, establishing your security. You're not really so concerned about um, you know, things like buying influence and, you know, participating in the political process. That's more of a second and third generation um, thing, I think. And so uh, I have seen, uh, you know, I have friends in San Francisco um, uh, who are major donors who are Asian American. Uh, they are people I go to if I want to raise money for my campaign. It's hard to get money out of the older generation. They will make me have tea with them and, you know, spend a lot of time. But I will, you know, get a check eventually one by one, those, you know, those max out checks are hard to get. Um, but it is a generational thing, and I think we're going to see it more, um, particularly, I would say, in the Indian American community and Pakistani American community. We've been very successful in Silicon Valley. Those people who have their $10 million homes in Los Altos Hills, now they're getting out their checkbooks. So it's part of status as well to hold a fundraiser in your fancy house um, and you know park the, park the Lamborghini in front of it. So I think there are, there are places it's coming in the next few years. Okay, what about the rise of China? What does that mean for uh, Asian Americans, for Chinese Americans? Uh, I'll uh, make it more general. What about the rise of Asia? There's a concern these days about the rise of the East, the decline of the West. How do Asian Americans fit in? Will this make it easier or harder for us? You know, the concerns about busloads of Chinese tourists, uh, both yeah. desired for their shopping <laughs> and disliked uh, for their rudeness. Does right. that affect Asian Americans <laughs> in public life? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to the um, story of the New York Times journalist, which is, you know, go back to China. I think that's, we're going to see a lot more of that. And we're already seeing it in our office in terms of um, Chinese scientists who are being profiled as spies and uh, folks who are doing economic espionage. I mean, there were four dropped prosecutions of US citizens of Chinese descent who had been falsely accused of um, spying for China. Um, and these folks are, I mean, you have actually people who um, in the academic community, I think, uh, are quite fearful about doing, um, you know, work across, you know, which is funny because academia is all about um, working, you know, with people in other countries. And um, and so it's, um, I think it's, it's we, we are in for a rough, rough ride ahead. I think the bogeyman, you know, that's, that's China. It could also be Pakistan and India. I don't think we're far behind. I think it's also exacerbated by the political narrative uh, 
by um, the one of the major candidates in um, the presidential election when they sort of talk in very uh, pejorative terms and terminology specifically. And I'll say in Silicon Valley, uh, in the Cupertino School District, we have majority uh, Asian Pacific Islanders in the school district. And during this election cycle, uh, I've been a recipient of a number of correspondence from voters who are saying uh, the white flight or that they are to to continuing to get out of here because they don't like uh, Chinese buying in cash these homes in these neighborhoods. And that if you go to any of these tech companies, vast majority of them uh, consist of Asian Pacific Islanders. And so I do think it is a significant issue um, to which why I do think it is important that we continue to demonstrate the capabilities of our community. And that's why I'm excited, for example, that we have a, uh, for the first time ever a historic opportunity in 2018 where you have an Asian Pacific Islander running for governor uh, who will have a very good chance uh, this cycle to demonstrate, again, the for the sixth largest economy in the world, and that's in our state treasurer, John Chung, who has announced his candidacy for governor. But again, what does that mean when the sixth largest economy in the world is watching the head of state um, focus on representing a community in the United States? And again, when I talked about number two and number three in terms of GDP, China and Japan, what does that mean for us? Uh, what does that mean for the community in terms of the policies and the representation of us as well, too? And I oftentimes talk to, again, other millennials that are Asian Pacific Islanders, and they think, I ask the question oftentimes about stats. I sort of give a, a, a quiz and say, well, what do you think the percentages of Asian Pacific Islanders in Santa Clara County, in California, and the United States? And they're usually way off. Uh, but when you go to other states, um, we are not as uh, common to see in these communities. And so what is the personal experience that we um, uh, see uh, as it relates to being uh, American. So there, oh, think, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think all I have to do is go back and look at history and just be reminded, uh, again, Chinese Americans are the only group in our nation's history that were ever excluded from immigrating, Chinese Americans. Japanese Americans were the only group to, again, be incarcerated, put in concentration camps, uh, they're the only group in our nation's history to have to go through that. So you, all you have to do is just go back in history. And I remember just recently there was an incident that just sort of happened so quickly, but it was uh, amazing to me how quickly uh, this sort of racial hysteria, this um, foreign hysteria moved. Um, it, it was when we had an American spy plane that landed accidentally on Hainan Island, which is an island uh, in China. It's kind of like the Hawaii of China, but much closer than Hawaii. Um, and China's reaction, of course, just imagine if we had a Chinese spy plane land in Catalina Island or something, what would our reaction be? Obviously, the reaction wasn't uh, very positive. But uh, again, what was interesting was the American reaction. It was like the comments on the radio, the comments on the talk show. There, there was talks to boycott Chinese restaurants. I don't know how that's possible, <laughs> but there were talks to boycott Chinese restaurants. Um, uh, nationally, that's a very interesting strategy. Um, but to me, the, the immediate and visceral reaction, again, this is an American spy plane landing in China, not a Chinese spy plane landing in the US. Um, and their reaction and how this um, sort of latent racism came out so quickly. So I, I think going back to your question is something, it, it is a cautionary tale. And we have to be very cognizant that we have historic examples of how quickly things can devolve when foreign relations unravel in that how we could be on the, on the brunt of that and how it is important at that point to really stand together. I know that during World War II, you had Chinese Americans wearing, hey, I'm not Japanese American, right, on their, on their, um, on their clothes to really make that distinction because they were, they were fearful. They were honestly fearful, but I think it's really important to know going into potentially this sort of situation how, how we do have to really uh, stand together. It'll be even probably more important to have that Asian, Asian American cohesion at that point. Okay, so the other uh, predominant stereotype, in addition to the perpetual foreigner, is the model minority, the notion that we're all overachievers uh, doing a little too well. Uh, how does that affect Asian Americans in politics and in uh, public discourse? Are our issues seem uh, seen as less important, less pressing than those uh, presented uh, by others?
Um, well, uh, working at a civil rights and a legal services um, office where we have low income API clients daily in our office, we see that, you know, um, the model minority myth just masks the reality for lots of um, APIs. And so um, it's true, I think it is, I think there is this perception that we don't have any problems and, you know, it's, um, we have some of the most vulnerable folks, Southeast Asians who are dealing with the criminal justice system. We've got folks who are struggling in terms of access to education um, and, <clears throat> You know, we've had a series of cases of restaurant workers, shuttle van drivers. Um, these are folks who don't aren't getting even the minimum wage. I mean, they're experiencing wage theft on a daily basis. Um, and those are not when 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 folks think about Asian Americans, they're not thinking about those people. Um, and I think that that's. You know, and um, at some level, we all, I think for those of us who are professionals, I'm a lawyer, you know, we do have a responsibility to educate folks beyond that model minority myth. I mean, I think we really, uh, yeah, in order to meet the needs of our communities. Yeah, to, to, that, to that point that Ar Arthi made, um, as a lawyer as well, serving the community, Indian Americans have the highest income of any minority in America. And so people don't look at that community and see the domestic violence. Uh, they don't see the hate crimes. They don't see the massive employment discrimination in Silicon Valley. I represent plaintiffs in employment discrimination cases and you know, a good third of my cases are Indian American tech workers who are being underpaid, who are being fired, who are being exploited by frankly other Indian Americans sometimes because they're under a visa and they can't leave. And nobody's speaking for those communities. I don't see, you know, with all due respect to my colleagues who are legislators, you don't control it because it's not federal, but uh, I don't see a lot of attention being paid to making sure that the immigrant minorities are not being exploited. And, and, and our own communities deny it. So let's be honest about that as well. Um, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna talk to an Indian American and say, you know what, domestic violence is widespread in our Sikh community, our Punjabi community. People deny it. Oh, no, no. That's for poor people or you know, that's for Latinos, that's for that other minority over there. We don't do it or one person does it but he's crazy. So we have a lot of denial in our own communities that feeds into this. And, and part of that's cultural as well. I mean, nobody wants to show their vulnerabilities to the world. Nobody wants their neighbors to think that they're not you know, doing really well. Um, certainly that's true of the Punjabi community. People are very status conscious. So they don't ask for help. Um, that whole concept of going to your legislator or your city councilman and asking for help is even somewhat taboo in our communities. So uh, we'll go uh, through all the panelists with just a very brief closing statement in just one sentence. What piece of advice do you have for those gathered here who are interested in politics and public life? What might you go back and tell your own younger self? Yes, all right. Well, get involved. I think uh, I would say uh, don't ever discount your own personal experiences and how important it is to take those experiences into your public life. They're incredibly valuable. Well, as a non politician, I will say hold your politicians accountable. I would echo get involved and also don't necessarily listen to what your parents tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, Asians, we like to have a uh, saving face and the best foot forward and everything's wonderful. Um, but oftentimes you learn from your failures. So don't be afraid to fail because you can learn so much from that. So I'd like to make sure that we, uh, we uh, thank all of our sponsors. Those are the Asian Pacific American Institute of Congressional <laughs> Studies, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, uh, the Asian Law Caucus, Chinese for Affirmative Action, the South Asian Bar Association of Northern California, University of California Hastings College of the Law. And our panelists uh, this evening were Assembly Member David Chu, uh, Assessor and Recorder Carmen Chu, 
a Republican National Committee uh, woman from California, Harmeet Dillon, Interim Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Arti Kohli, Assembly Member Evan Lowe, and Assembly Member Phil Ting. Please join me in giving them a big round of applause uh, for the thoughtful dialogue.